Hadirin sekalian mengumumkan keberangkatan tiba Duli Yang Maha Mulia Raja Zaris Sofia binti Almarhum Sultan Idris Shah. Ladies and gentlemen, announcing the arrival of Her Royal Highness Raja Zaris Sofia binti Almarhum Sultan Idris Shah. Ladies and gentlemen, you may take your seats now. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Menghadap Duli Yang Maha Mulia Raja Zaris Sofia binti Almarhum Sultan Idris Shah. Ampun tuanku beribu-ribu ampun sembah patik mohon diampun. Patik mohon perkenan tuanku untuk memulakan atur cara majlis. Ampun tuanku. Terlebih dahulu, patik bagi pihak World Islamic Economic Forum dengan penuh takzim yang merafat sembah menjunjung setinggi-tinggi kasih di atas limpah perkenan tuanku berangkat mencuma duli ke sesi dialog di sini pagi ini. Sesungguhnya keberangkatan tuanku memang dinanti-nantikan dan pastinya membuatkan lagi forum ini lebih bermakna lagi. Ampun Tuanku, Patik mohon kenan Tuanku untuk mengalung-alukan para hadirin dan untuk meneruskan majlis dalam bahasa Inggeris. Ampun Tuanku. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you and welcome to the final but very special session indeed of the WIEF Business Women Forum at this 8th World Islamic Economic Forum. We are indeed honoured and privileged to be able to welcome Her Royal Highness Raja Zarif Sofia binti Almarhum Sultan Idris Shah for this face-to-face -face dialogue promoting social entrepreneurship, challenges and opportunities. With that, ladies and gentlemen, it's our pleasure to invite Nabi Bagir Professor Tan Sri Datuk Wira Dr. Sharifa Hapsa Syed Hassan Shahbuddin, the Vice-Chancellor of University Kebangsaan Malaysia, to moderate this session. Dengan segala hormatnya, dipersilakan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Menghadap Kuah Duli Yang Maha Mulia, Raja Zaris Sofia, Patik, mohon kenan tuanku untuk memulakan session ini. Firstly, I would like to thank the organisers for inviting me to moderate this session. It's a great honour uh, to do this face-to-face -face dialogue. Our topic is social entrepreneurship. It is an emerging area of importance for solving society's pressing problems. The um, business sector, as you know, has long known that uh, there is nothing more powerful than a new idea uh, being put in the hands of a first-class entrepreneur because they can change the face of business and even create new uh, industries. Similarly, the social entrepreneur recognizes social problems and use entrepreneurial principles to organize, create, and manage social ventures um, in such a way that the profits derived are used to achieve caring social outcomes, be they in education, health, or economic opportunities, and so on. And rather than leaving social uh, needs for the government and private sector to tackle, social entrepreneurs find out what is not working and they look for innovative solutions to make the change. Today, I have the honour of introducing Her Royal Highness Raja Zari Sofia, who is well known for her work with numerous organisations, including the Malaysian Red Cross Society and the Hospice Programme her education at Oxford, and her influence as the wife of the Sultan of Johor, in combination with her acute awareness and sensitivity to society's pressing problems, make her an outstanding social entrepreneur. 
Her influence is also felt through her writings as a columnist in two major newspapers. Her Royal Highness is Chancellor of University Technology Malaysia and Royal Fellow at University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Um, some of you may not know, but I think it's well known. She is an avid painter and Her Royal Highness has um, I'm sorry, this is technology. I'm trying to go to the next page. <laughs> her Royal Highness uh, paints and uh, her painting, uh, she participates in art exhibitions and her paintings are sold and the profits or the sales are used for social causes. To me, this looks like an entrepreneurial venture. And so uh, we look forward to your Royal Highness turning your creative talents, especially in writing, and perhaps working uh, with major publications and or publishers, uh, which can turn your creativity into money that can be used in uh, social ventures. That is the social um, entrepreneur that we are looking for, and we look forward to hearing so much uh, from you, and we will start the, the session now. Your Highness, um, would you, could you share with us some of the work that you have been doing um, in uh, alleviating the plight of the rakyat and improving the quality of life for them? Um, I, I've been doing this uh, for quite some time now, but usually as a guest of honour <coughs> to attend uh, tea parties and so on. But in uh, 2006, um, I'm quite ashamed to say it was because of a Hollywood uh, film uh, which made me cry. I, I called up um, the deputy chairman of the Malaysian Red Crescent and said I would like to be a part of Malaysian Red Crescent, not, not just as a guest of honour, but if I could actually contribute and be a part of the team. So that was in um, October. In November, I attended the Asia-Pacific uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent conference in, in Singapore and it was a bit like this. There was, uh, I think, delegates from about 50 countries and it was something that really inspired me, made a huge difference to me that, you know, we can do so much when we are all united together. And then, um, so they, they created a um, committee for me which was called the Community Services and that was especially for me. Um, I don't know why, but they did it. And then in um, December of 2006 and uh, the following year, we had really, really bad floods in the state of Johor. And I, I sent a text message to Ante Isham, and I said, who was the deputy chairman of Malaysian Red Crescent, and I said, what do I do now? And he said, well, welcome to the world of Red Crescent, because I'd gone for the disaster management uh, workshop and so on at the conference in Singapore. So the first thing we, we had to decide to do was to get a, a call center, a help center, and which coincidentally happened to be at Putri Pacific Hotel. And from then on, we were able to get um, people who, who needed information about their relatives or their families who were affected and who were not at this um, call center. So that worked. So that was one of the more uh, defining moments for me. And uh, the other thing I'd like to um, share with you is that I feel that um, those of us who are so-called VIPs or people who are at the top um, should at least feel um, more connected, not, not just by you know, handing a check and that's it. So what I did uh, at the floods was to actually go into the houses of the people who, whose houses were destroyed and to see for myself what happened. And then you realize that it's, it's more than just what you see in, in the newspapers and all the photographs that you see. Um, 
there's an awful stench, very, very terrible smell because of the floodwaters carry waste as well. And in some houses, the mud was up to the knee, uh, yeah, up to our knees. And everything was destroyed in most of these houses. So that was one thing that I really wanted to do, to see for myself, to, to actually be in, in contact with the people who were suffering and who were the flood victims, and to see how their houses were, were destroyed. And uh, we did that, and we also gave, um, together with the Red Crescent, things that they obviously would need, uh, food um, rations, gas cookers, because all their kitchens were destroyed, mattresses, blankets, pillows, everything that they needed. Um, one thing that I overlooked, and, and somebody who, a journalist who had been to Aceh at the, during the tsunami said to me, what about the women? They, they would need some items, uh, unmentionable here, you know, for, we know, we know. yes. And I said, yes, I forgot about that. So we had lorry loads of these coming from Kuala Lumpur, as well as lorry loads of um, underwear for the women. So we were learning as we went along what was needed. And it's not only just food and you know, what, what is often uh, reported, but little nitty gritty things like this. And of, of course, the, the food also, it can't be things that can go off um, or, or be um, bad, go bad very quickly. It has to be something that can last. So biscuits are one of those, tea, coffee, and, and so on. Uh, it's very obvious that empathy is very important and which you have plenty of. Um, but I do uh, detect this, this is crisis management when there's a disaster, there's a flood, and they, they can come once, they can come once in three years, but they can come every year. So there's a need to have some sustainability in, in um, trying to help people in this sort of situations. So what are the main challenges in, in, in trying to sustain the activities, say, of the Red Crescent, for example? Um, it always comes down to dollars and cents, so we need donations. Um, unfortunately, this, I think, applies to all associations, to all NGOs, all charities, uh, that every year everyone needs to have their funds uh, increased. And so every year, most of these NGOs and so on will have to do fundraising of some kind. Um, it, it's the same with our uh, Red Crescent. We have to do that as well. Uh, because once you give out so many numbers of, of mattresses, blankets, pillows, and so on, you will have to replenish that. And the only way we can do that is from the public and from the corporations, really the, the you know, big, big ones like Kazana. I think. Where are they? Somewhere. Sang Dabi. Sang Dabi, yes. All those. So. Wish you have plenty in Iskandar and Johor. Um, Duanko, of course, financing is a big problem for a lot of people who are like you, very involved in um, charity work. Um, a Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Muhammad Yunus, sees social business as a way of solving society's pressing problems, uh, such as poverty. Yeah. And he believes that we can harness the energy of profit-making, like the companies we see mm -hmm. behind us, um, to create self-supporting, uh, viable commercial enterprises, uh, to produce goods and services um, that are dedicated to solving social issues. Um, number one. And number two, that the profits they make out of this, is that, that's ploughed back into the social cause. Um, they only get back um, what they invest in. Beyond that, the dividends go into developing um, the social issues that plague humankind all this while. And Dr. Muhammad Yunus, through the Grameen Bank, has created social businesses uh, with renowned companies. And um, 
based on this principle that they don't they, the only thing they get back is their investment yes. and through this mechanism he has been able to bring uh, to provide micronutrients to impoverished children um, through yogurt produced by Danone, for example, the company, at very affordable prices yes. through the enterprise that they create. Um, with the shoe company, also renowned shoe company, they make affordable sandals, so children are not exposed to parasitic infection. Uh, clean water to arsenic areas through a company that produces water but sell very, very, very cheaply uh, to places, to developing countries. So do you, do you see this happening with our corporations in Malaysia? How can you influence them to do this? Well, this forum is one way, um, with all those lists of names. Um, I, I think uh, social entrepreneurship is, is something quite new in Malaysia, and I hope that it's going to catch on. But uh, we're, we're a long way from having more and more companies uh, and corporations involved in this kind of work. Um, although I, I can see from the work that I've done, uh, again with the Red Crescent, that there were many companies and, and uh, multinational companies too, such as Nestle, for example, who would um, donate food and, and in kind to not just the flood victims, but also to hospitals, the children in the hospitals, and sorry, <clears throat> and it, during uh, festive occasions when we go to the hospital, and they, they will offer some some kind of uh, goodie bags for for the children and also for the adult patients. So I think we we are progressing a bit slow, perhaps, but we'll get there. I hope, inshallah. They 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 probably see this as corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm and they will do when they're requested and so on. So perhaps, uh, Your Highness, your influence, because you're, you really influence a lot of people through your writings, uh, firstly, yeah. uh, and um, that you could then let them think about viable enterprises that they can go into that can support some of the social causes that you're doing. Uh, for example, the floods will not go away. No unless we do some mitigation. So perhaps some of the companies they form could look into these sort of mm -hmm. issues uh, so that once and for all we can solve this problem. What do you think about that? I think um, they will have to work with the government because I know that the government in, in Johor in particular, they, they have looked into this problem of, of flood mitigation and flood control, in, especially in districts like uh, Batu Pahat where that is, is a low-lying ground. Um, but that is very much a, a government incentive and a government uh, project. Unless the government requests from some of these corporations if they would like to, to contribute, I don't know how that's going to work out. Um, I know Khazana, for example, has the smart school projects, yes. you know. Uh, perhaps maybe Kazana is one company you might want to talk perhaps. to first because they have embarked on something like this. Okay. Anybody from Kazana here? No? Oh, well, I'll, I'll corner one of them later on. Um, yes, it, it, I think that's a good idea, but I think uh, it, it shouldn't be just one or two corporations. I think it should be something that we all do uh, for, for the sake of... of everyone who in, in this country. Um, the other way, of course, and I think you do it, Your Highness, rather well, is to help like single women um, through entrepreneurship to raise their living standards. So perhaps you'd like to share that with us? Um, actually, I, I'm not involved in that, but um, there are the wives of, of the um, politicians here in, in Johor who have gone to, to do some of these projects. And one of them is to train some of these single ladies how to sew, and from that they can actually um, support themselves because they are single women. And th this sort of a training where you, you teach them a skill will in the end be, be something that can last their whole lives and 
will make them less dependent on the government or any kind of contributions from the public. So it make them you know, uh, be able to stand on their own two feet. Yeah, we know, of course, the government has several schemes like Amana Iktia Malaysia and so on that will help women upgrade their businesses and their skills. But I still do find that um, women are not taken through the whole process of um, doing the business, being entrepreneurs, uh, helping them find markets, improving their products, um, helping them with branding, with packaging. Sometimes these sort of processes are missing. Uh, perhaps we give them money to start a business, yes. then we don't hold their hands. So what do you think? What, what can be done about this? What else do we need to do? I, actually, my, I, I might be wrong, but my personal feeling is that our women are rather quite shy and, and we are not as aggressive as women from other ca countries can be. So the idea that you know, we have to keep on uh, holding their hands, like you say, and, and trying to make them do their work, maybe um, a bit not too much, but pr probably will infringe on them. I think the main thing is that we should encourage them to be independent, both so, uh, economically and financially. And to that end, maybe we can have more forums where we can um, instill in them that being independent is important. Coming back to social business, yep. because um, as you know, Professor Muhammad Yunus is yes. our laureate in residence. And of course, we hope Tuanku, you yes. will meet him this Saturday because he will be in uh, UKM. By the way, I forgot to say, uh, Tuanku is not only the Chancellor of University Technology Malaysia, she's also the Royal Fellow of University Kebangsaan Malaysia. We are so honoured and proud to her to have her as our fellow and we've benefited a lot from her thinking. She doesn't uh, fail, she has never failed to deliver the keynotes at our biennial conferences. Um, so, the, the, the way forward is really to help, uh, to get for profits mm -hmm. to develop these enterprises that will really solve the, the, the problems. And as you say, um, perhaps they need a big some push yes. in, in our country because uh, we don't see it that, that obviously. And, and we don't have like Muhammad Yunus, that's why we are setting up a centre called Yunus UKM Centre for Social Enterprise to really start people thinking about this. And um, what can the government do? to push this social enterprise? What do you um, think it can be done? I think uh, one, of, one of the things that we lack in this country, we have a lot of um, educational institutions. We have schools, we have colleges, we have universities. But what we don't have um, is vocational training, such as carpentry, cooking, and so on. And what I see from countries like uh, the United Kingdom, students or, or young people who may not be academic, academically bright will need these kind of opportunities where they can be skilled or taught skills in carpentry and, and so on. And if we can have more vocational schools, I think that would be a, a, a good step forward for the ones who are not so bright and who do not want to go to university, who are not interested in being, uh, academics. So in other words, you are saying perhaps uh, the government could provide incentives yep. for maybe the private sector to set up more of these schools, uh, which is social enterprise mm -hmm. as well, because you are um, helping to up, uh, upgrade the skills of the, the yeah. students who may never progress in their life if they don't have that. So perhaps in the way of um, uh, tax relief, <laughs> which which I think the companies behind us would love that. Uh, but it is again to let the private sector participate yes. in this kind of activities. Uh, as, as it is, I see most of them would like to start universities. Yeah. And Tuanku, you have correctly pointed out that it is these other um, yes. vocational and technical mm. schools that we really need uh, with skills training 
for, for the, the, the youth especially of our country. I, I'd just like to give one example. For example, if we have uh, young men who are not academically bright or who are not interested in going to university, but who have an interest in uh, motorbikes or, you know, or in cars, if we are able to give them instruction or a course in, in how to repair uh, a motorcycle and so on, and, and give them that kind of grounding, they can actually set up a workshop of their own. And from then on, they'll be able to earn a living just from having a, a workshop or a, a shop of their own. So this is important. It's not just to create more universities for young people who Let's face it, not all are going to be, uh, want to be academics. Some are more interested, like I say, in, in fixing broken uh, motorbikes and, and cars. And if their interest lies in that, then we should actually uh, encourage them to do that, N not try to push them the other way. Yes. Uh, I can share our experience in UKM. You know we have this marampet. <laughs> These are the motor, yeah, young people who really go racing on their motorbikes in the, in the night and really yeah. uh, can Illegal cause racing, yeah. problems to a lot of people. So actually we do bring them in. Yeah. Uh, we work with the police and bring them into our centre called Youth Empowerment. And we take them through mm -hmm. a process to make them realise who they are and what their goals and missions in life uh, are uh, because a lot of them are really clueless and they don't have any goals in life. Mm. So the first thing is to make them realize this. Second thing is to provide them the skills to motivate them to yes. take up businesses. And it's true what you've just said. This sort of youth prefer to be to be working with motorcycles yes. to become mechanics because that's what they like. So it's not just about opening schools, as you say, but also to make sure it addresses the needs of the youth. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you... Um I, I think we have to be realistic and, and not push our expectations on them, but rather let them tell us what they want to do. Um, and, and hotels like, like this one, they can get these uh, young people to come in and, and work in the um, restaurants or in, in, in the kitchens and, and train them as uh, chefs. Yes. which is another thing that can be done. There's a, another thing we observe when we do this program with the youth is that we talk about talented youth and we think mm. immediately of um, the gifted children who are academically mm. gifted or those who can do uh, the performing arts uh, from already advantaged backgrounds. But what we found was that the youth are talented but they have no opportunities to express their talents. And when we do this program, we found when you ask them, why are you out here not in school? They say, the school doesn't want me and I don't want to go to school. That's fine. I get great E, they say. But then we found they can sing. Um, they like to do, the girls mm, like the, to do makeup. They become makeup artists. You can train them for that. And even some of the boys, they like to cook. They can bake uh, cupcakes. And so what, what happened is their talents are now turned into a commercial yes. value. And they can make money and they can be independent. So instead of going on the motorbike, as Mark Rempit, they are now very productive citizens of yes. the community. So, so there is, but we need, I think, people to realise that they can invest in this. Yes. And companies can yeah. invest. And we certainly think you are one of the proponents <laughs> the influential oh, ones who can do this, uh, Tuan Ko. Thank you. Uh, my question is, you are associated with two universities. You graduated, yes. of course, from one great university. We hope that the two you're associated with are also great. Uh, <laughs> but, so, what do you think we can do more to, to help in terms of being social entrepreneurs? Um, for the universities, apart from I think uh, supporting this kind of, of um, work or, or providing this sort of uh, training for the, the young people, as we mentioned, uh, you know, for those who, who want to be mechanics, those who want to be cooks and so on, there, there is something that I feel very strongly about and that is that 
a, a lot of our young people cannot afford to go to university or have a good education. And to that end, I think it's important for UKM and UTM to offer scholarships. That is still one of the best ways of helping our young people. And especially, it is a, it's also one way of getting rid of ignorance and of helping them get out of the, well, if they're from very poor families, to rise up above that and then to, to actually make a name for themselves. So scholarships, I think, from universities will help a lot. Uh, and of course, what we spoke about, the vocational schools as well. Uh, of course, in the universities, we might not do that as a program, mm. but we could, like we do in a project in Kampung Kerinci, yes. in Kuala Lumpur, uh, develop programs for the, the children there, but bring in people who are doing vocational training to help. So in that way, we, we can help. Um, but if I could share, uh, in UKM, since we're having Professor Yunus with us, we are already starting a program on social enterprise so that we can train people to be social entrepreneurs. Uh, it, it has some skills. You need to use entrepreneurial approach and you need to identify which is the social problem. So perhaps this is another way. Um, this morning, we heard about business and technology. It was a very interesting session. I think, I think the participants are sitting in here and they shared a lot with us. And in the university too, I think there is this, you can be social entrepreneurs by converting your research uh, to be used for community development. Uh, for example, I think in UTM, you would know a lot about this. In UKM, we have things like solar panels. Yes. Firstly, you can engage women to assemble and so you can create jobs for them. The other, of course, is to use the panels for application in very remote areas, mm -hmm. or we use it for fishermen to yeah. dry their fish. Yes. And uh, if you could share, maybe you have some experiences about this. Um, not, not with UTM, but with the um, Malaysian Red Crescent. We do have our uh, programs such as Kampung Angkat, meaning that mm -hmm. we, we foster a, a village. And one of these uh, villages it was Kampung Pata, which is in the Endau Rompin, um, area in, in um, Johor and these are Orang Asli uh, it's an Orang Asli village and they needed some kind of sustainable livelihood so they wanted to breed cows and, and, and sheep but we said that's a bit you know too ambitious start off with, with something smaller so we had some experts and, and, and some people who were interested um, in teaching them how to grow mushrooms mm -hmm. and you don't need a, a big area which you would need if you were breeding cows and so on but just a small area within the, the um, village itself and from growing these, these uh, mushrooms they can sell them yes. every month and so that, that's one way that beautiful can work. example it, of social business yes. start small I mean you know <laughs> don't, we don't have to be ambitious yes. um, you do a lot. Can you tell us what keep you going? <laughs> I, I think Share some of your secrets. Yeah, I think and still look young, <laughs> so young, <laughs> like she's just out of school. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> that was thirty years ago. Um, I, I think it's knowing that I can make a difference to just one child or just one family. That that's good enough. We we, we have. I think all of us, you know, when we want to do charity work or we want to do some good in this world, we always think we'd like to save the whole world. And of course, it's, that's not uh, possible. So we try to do the best we can um, with the Grameen uh, Bank, which uh, Mr. Mo uh, Muhammad Yunus, yes. yeah, Muhammad Yunus uh, started. He, he's thinking specifically of, of the area where he grew up in and which he's um, used to. Um, and of course, you know, when we, see, when we think about tsunamis and, and hurricanes and thunderstorms, we would like to help and, you know, the drought in Africa and so on. But I think we always have to start small and start with what we have around us, be aware of the local problems that we have, because local problems in uh, Malaysia might not be the same in another country. Mm -hmm. So, and awareness is, is important. And for me, it's, 
really that, that, that you know, just to see that uh, a child smiling back and, and knowing that he's happy, that, that keeps me going. I, I want to quote you because she has just shown her the side of being a pragmatist and a realist in doing the work that she's doing. In, in the, I did some research, Tonzo. In year 2007, in her column in The Star, she said, I am one of those fools who dream of saving the world, but who, in the end, realize that what each of us can achieve isn't that much. Well, actually, many of us would like to disagree with you. You have done much, and you will do more. I am very sure. Do you want to have some last say? Um, a few words? Yes, I'm, I'm going to plug uh, a foundation that was just created for me because I see there's a, a lot of people from overseas. Um, I hope this is not wrong, but um, we've re recently just launched, together with UTM and the state government of Johor, uh, a foundation bearing my name. And this is in part to uh, produce enough funds for, for scholarships for, for, um, from, for any students from any universities in Malaysia. But specifically, to start off with, we're going to start a, um, a center. And again, it is going to uh, bear my name. It's, it's the Zari Sophia Center for Global Islamic Studies. And this will be um, held in, I'm sorry, it's, it's going to be at Lehigh University in Philadelphia. Um, I'm, I'm, tr I'm going to try and get all the names of, of people who are from America after this, and, and I'll just go to each and every one of them and beg them if they can support me in this. But <laughs> I think you'd agree with me that there is a great need for an understanding of Islam, and that if you see... Thank you. And if you see that, you know, how we are here, uh, we're not aggressive people, we're, we're not doing anything bad, and we, we're just listening to each other and we can laugh and we all have the same concerns. We're all worried about uh, poverty, we all want to try and make the world a better place. So I'm hoping that this global center in, in an American university can bring across those ideas that we're, we're not such a bad lot after all. And I'm, I'm of course going to ask uh, Tansri Sharifa also to be there to, to um, share with us the things that you've um, learned through your uh, vice chancellorship. Yes? Uh, actually, there were lots more that we <laughs> researched and go, and I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> we, um, and that's because she has brought up this issue about uh, misunderstanding of Islam. And actually, in um, this year, in February, Her Royal Highness spoke very movingly about the similarities be between people of different faiths. And that's at Somerville College. And how she deplored the demonization of Islam that followed the attacks on the World Trade Center in New York. And of course, the bombings in uh, London in 2005. And, uh, but of course we must, she reminded the audience that similar attacks had also killed large numbers of Muslims in Southeast Asia. And at that talk, she talked about the fears, her own fears for her family, the fears and anxieties shared by people in all parts of the world afflicted by the violence. Um, she reminded as, of course, the extremists who believe in jihad comprise less than 1% of all people of Islamic faith. And yet the Western press too often portrays them as representative of Islam. So I'm so happy you have established this. I'm sure you'll go a long way in explaining Islam to the rest of the world. Thank you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think we have to end. Okay. Would you like to say something? You want to say something? I think I've said enough. I, I would like to end <laughs> by saying here is the social entrepreneur with the vision and commitment to carry out her work. Thank you very much.
Terima kasih, thank you yang bahagia Profesor Tan Sri Datuk Wira and uh, Dr. Sharifah Habsa also menjunjung kasih tuanku. Dengan izin, uh, with your kind permission tuanku, I'm going to be the, do a bit of promotion here. I know for a fact that uh, because uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sharifah Habsa did keep mentioning about uh, tuanku's writings and I know for a fact that um, selected articles uh, which were published in the Straits Times, the Sunday Mail as well as the Star have been chosen uh, and compiled into a book uh, which will soon be launched and we are all waiting for that and for those who have not, not had a chance of reading uh, Tuan Ku's thoughts, uh, it's an opportunity that uh, you can get the book to um, get to know uh, Tuan Ku better. So once again, Mujunjung um, Kasih Tuan Ku. And uh, to record this uh, historic moment, we'd like to invite Tuan Ku and also Professor for a photograph uh, so that uh, Junjung kasih tuanku. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this dialogue session. And um, once again, uh, we'd like to express our sincere gratitude to Her Royal Highness. And hadirin sekalian mengumumkan keberangkatan dulu yang maha mulia Raja Zahir Sofia meninggalkan majlis. Ladies and gentlemen, announcing uh, the departure of Her Royal Highness.